I don't think many people really understand Char's counterattack. Despite its amazing visuals and acting as the first grand climax of the Universal Century, as the final climax of Char and Amaro's stories, it is, to be blunt, a complicated work. It isn't really like the conclusions of any other story of its scale I know of. It isn't the kind of obvious, if fun, conclusion of Return of the Jedi. It isn't the heroic triumph of Return of the King. It is tragic. It is troubled. Now I know the obvious thing here, isn't that great? I could imagine someone saying, You, the essayist, get to make that clear. Isn't that why you exist? To present to us that truth we feel but can't quite voice. Now normally I would simply answer, yes, absolutely. I can be the cool Morpheus and you can be the cool Neo shattering the grand mystery. But counter to the obvious nature, obvious answer, I would still answer, no. No, I would really like to exist in a world where everyone understood Char's counterattack, where this video would be pointless. Understood it at least in the way perhaps I do. Because the fact we do not, the fact I feel very compelled to write and create this video, speaks to something underlying it all. Both Char's counterattack and this video are driven by something unhappy. An unpleasant frustration. A frustration with the world. A personal frustration. A frustration I think very much Yoshiyuki Tamino felt. When deciding how to create an ending for the story of Shar and Amaro, he didn't make a big, happy, satisfied conclusion. He didn't make a grand triumph of resounding victory. What he made was a work bound up in a lot of painful frustration. Many people love the wonderful animation, the great mobile suits, the military desperation, but I question just how many know just what this work is. I don't dislike these people at all. I want to emphasize now, this is very much not an elitist dismissal. In fact, as we will soon see later, true to CCA's themes, it can't be. I think I'm not alone in feeling this way either at all. Who better to sum it up than Hideaki Anno of Evangelion fame, and Mamoru Oshii of Ghost in the Shell and Pat Lever, among other things. Ano, as a creator, I like CCA because you can hear Mr. Tomino's very genuine voice in it. But Mr. Oshii, you tend to dislike doing that. You try to sugarcoat your true intentions and hide it deep within. So it's unexpected that someone like you enjoyed CCA. Oshii, well, isn't it just that? As you said, Mr. Tomino's raw voice is all out in the open. Ano. Yes, it's very direct. I think sensitive people may even harbor hatred for it. Oshi. Even so, I was impressed that a script like CCA was greenlit. How could they release something like that? Probably because they weren't watching it very seriously. Everyone is so enchanted by the surface level space war aspect that there's very few people who accurately grasp Mr. Tomino's intentions. Before I can dive into the truth of that frustration though, there is quite a lot to talk about in regard to Char's counterattack how it was made, and who made it. Before even that, I should, as always, say thank you to Morlock for getting me started making videos, and also thank you for the great research efforts of Kanan and helping me get what I needed to make it, and for this time in particular, a special thanks to Ihoba and Haru. Their direct translations of the Shars Counterattack official complete works helped make this video possible. Thank you. On the financial side, I would as well like to thank Scuttlefish for funding, as well as all my patrons, and ask that if you enjoy these videos and my work on YouTube, please consider supporting me there. With that, I would like to offer one correction for a previous mistake in the last two videos. I accidentally showed Jonathan Clemens' photo as the photo of Mark Simmons. Mark doesn't actually have any photos, so sorry, that was... yeah, that was Clemens. My bad. With that out of the way, I invite you to come with me as we descend into that final entry of the initial Gundam series. The first ending of the Universal Century. The tragic, frustrated fates of Amuro Ray and Shar Aznabal. In this, on Gundam, Shar's Counterattack.
It probably won't surprise anyone to start by saying that, once again, the primary motivation for both CCA's creation and the form came from our old culprit, the Gunpla. After Double Zeta failed to result in sufficient sales, plans for any kind of a Triple Zeta were scrapped, as I mentioned in the previous video. Considering how well 0079's Gunpla sales had done around the time of the film releases, the decision was made to pursue the next chapter of Gundam as just that, a movie. It seems very ironic that Sunrise and Bandai, in retrospect, seem laughably ignorant of the larger cultural forces that caused 0079's huge success, equating it down just simply to movie plus Gundam equals sales. As a familiar face, producer Kenji Uchida remarked in the CCA 4K accompanying booklet. Interviewer, how did the planning for Shar's counterattack begin? Uchida, now, I don't remember the exact beginning, however, the main premise was that the movie version of Mobile Suit Gundam was a hit, and Gundam's plastic models also sold very well. After that, director Tomino released other works other than Gundam. And this is where the Gundam long-awaited theory came out again. Those were Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam and Mobile Suit Double Zeta Gundam. But their commercial performances did not exceed expectations. Around 1986 and 1987, there was an atmosphere of, let's do more Gundam. Tomino began storyboards sometime around April 1987, just two months after Double Zeta's conclusion. Like Double Zeta to Zeta, CCA would try to keep the ball rolling. For the name, they would go with a title you may remember from the Zeta video, Char's Counterattack. Originally used in 1984 for the announcement of a sequel to 0079, this would be selected. Interestingly, Tomino wasn't the only one to initially attempt the script. Several other unnamed Sunrise writers would make attempts, but in the end, Kenji Uchida decided only Tomino could write this film, selecting him and saying, I couldn't have someone else write the script. Accompanying the movie's release in 1988 was a booklet of interviews. Interestingly, one of these shows that while Tomino's decision was not perhaps initially focused on the movie, overall he did embrace the film's approach. Tomino. The way I see it, basically I want my movies to be like a one-shot episode. When I say this, you may ask what the previous movies, Gundam 1, 2, and 3, were about, but those were in part a rehash of a TV series. So I actually think it's okay for such films to exist, because despite feeling this way, I still made them. However, I don't want people to think that all my films will be made that way. Personally, I didn't want people to think that we were just trying to get our money's worth if we split Char's counterattack into a part 1 and part 2, for example. On top of that, since the film is being made to settle the score from Gundam, I wanted it to be resolved in one episode. Those with a mind to timing may notice just how packed in the production schedule was, with the movie having a final cut on September 1987 and a premiere of March 88. In order to make this possible, many, many people's efforts were needed. Returning once again for the music was Shigeki Sagusa, with CCA being perhaps the great culmination of his soundtrack style introduced to Gundam with Zeta. The entire soundtrack is really quite exceptional, a fusion of classical and synth-laden jazz, which is generally, in my opinion, one of the strongest in Gundam's history. Sagusa by then had a wealth of classical experience, and it really shines through in CCA. Having already done the film scores to six other films, including two just in 1987 alone, and another one later in July of 88. With that in mind, it isn't surprising he works so well. From the tense anxiety of the story to its lighter moments, to its dramatic conclusion, CCA is hard to imagine without Sigusa's signature sound. One name sadly not returning was Yoshikazu Yasuhiko as animation director. Instead, as those who have glanced at CCA's intimidating credits will note, the film had a whopping seven people doing just that. Tomino himself pretty directly commented on this scenario from the 1988 movie booklet. Interviewer, how about the production staff? Tomino, the fact that there are seven animation directors listed in a row is obvious to anyone who looks. The reason why there are seven names is simply because after Yoshikazu Yasuhiko-kun, there has not been a main animation director who has done work comparable to him within Gundam. At the same time, it would require a great deal of effort to create something like Gundam after Yasuhiko-kun. The reason is that Gundam has a lot of volume, 
it would be cruel to expect such capacity from people who are age 25 or younger. Tomino, just after mentioning the workload was so tight, there was a struggle to complete scenes on schedule. Tomino, this became apparent as we continued the production work, especially in the first four months, where even if we went to extremes, there were times when not even a single cut would be finished. If, and this is just an if, but if those four months had gone smoothly, I think the level of completion of the cuts at the dubbing stage would have gone up considerably. There are many other reasons as to why this happened. However, due to the fact that it's Gundam, it was a job that demanded a certain volume, or rather, quantity, and the staff must have been very nervous and worked very hard, which is why I could not raise the volume of work. I became so focused on an individual cut, that's why when it was finished, the result was not satisfactory. In short, the desire in my heart to do my best caused me to spend more time than I should have. In other words, it's proof that good results will never come if you're all on your own, even if you try to do your best. I deeply regret that an experienced person like myself did not recognize the situation at an earlier stage before it happened, and I'm sorry for the pressure I put on the younger people as a result. Considering these demands, it would be a good time now to mention some of those very people who work so hard to make CCA come to life. Hidetoshi Omori would animate the amazing specific effects for things like missiles and beam sabers, and we will return to him in the next section just for that. Shinya Ohira simultaneously did a few scenes for CCA while also working that very same year on the equally momentous Akira. Not a bad resume, undoubtedly a ton of work for sure. Mitsuo Iso would finally enough be hired as a key animator, while also working as an animation director under a pseudonym, Mikio Odogawa. Yes, that, that's right. As the 4K CCA release booklet comically notes, he ended up going to work and drawing Gundam under his real name, then coming home and drawing Gundam again under his pen name. That is, uh, that's some dedication. Yasuomi Umetsu would do key animation for the train sequence in Sweetwater, being responsible for designing all the various characters and diverse peoples in that shot. Additionally, being the key animator for the One Year War flashback sequence showing Lala's death. Hiroyuki Ochi, who did a few key animation work on Zeta, would return for CCA as well. If you ever thought the Sazabi launch scene was similar to the Rick Diaz sequence in Zeta's first episode, well, he did both. Hiroyuki Kitazume, another veteran of Zeta, would return to do character design on CCA, updating the cast of familiar faces to their movie incarnations of Char, Amuro, Bright, and Hathaway, for example. As well, he did the new characters present. Speaking of which, it wouldn't surprise anyone that most of the voice cast also returned. Toru Furia and Shuichi Ikeda would return to their roles as Amuro and Char, commenting from the CCA official complete works that they focused on an aged tone, a sense of maturity and responsibility. Ikeda, I thought, this is the end, so I'll put my full energy into it. Furia, Tamiyo didn't request anything from us. Ikeda, I guess Tamino thinks Furia, Ikeda, and Suzuoki wouldn't grow up anymore. Furia, I think he trusts us. Hirotaka Suzuoki would return as Bright Noah as well. Interestingly, Nanai, Char's new love interest, was voiced by the returning Yoshiko Sakakibara, who played Haman Karn in Zeta and Double Zeta. The irony of this casting was probably intentional on Tamino's part. As for the new cast members, Mitsuki Yayoi would play Chan. Nozomu Sasaki would play Hathaway Noah. As if one young star and protagonist role was not enough, Sasaki would also start in 1988 to play one Julian Mintz in Legend of the Galactic Heroes. A personal favorite I one day aim to do a series on for sure. Koichi Yamadera was cast as Gune Gus, though I think most people would recognize him as Ryoji Kaji from Evangelion. Also interestingly, new would be one Maria Kawamura as Quest Pariah. Maria already starred as Leshi in L Game, and as viewers of this series might remember, read Tomino's animation Seki Sengen declaration at the premiere of the 0079 movies. So her involvement had a lot of cosmic destiny in it, let's say. Now the man who stood beside her, and later married her, with Tomino present at the wedding, is of course Mamoru Nagano. However, as I mentioned last time, he was unfortunately cursed with, you know, Bandai's pressure, and he was kicked off of participating in CCA. Having said that, you may have noticed I did not mention the mechanical design. It won't surprise many to say, yep, it's getting on its own section a bit later on. 
For now, though, the combined hard work of all these people meant, on March 12th of 1988, barely a year after Double Zeta, Mobile Suit Gundam, Char's Counterattack, would premiere in Japanese theaters. With that, we move on. To say Char's Counterattack is something of a visual feast is kind of an understatement. As mentioned in the last section, it really astounds me that both CCA and Akira would be produced in such close proximity. It shows that the industry was really ramping up across the 80s. 1988 in particular would also see Ghibli's Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies as well. It was a turbo-stacked year, to put it mildly. Returning to CCA, the execution of its view into Gundam's world provides perhaps one of the highest watermarks of animated detail and a really well-fleshed-out sense of just what its world, that world at war, and the machines of that war would look like, move, and sound like. I mentioned in the first video that one of the most important factors to Gundam's initial success really was its commitment to Dr. O'Neill's view of the colonization of space. That this generated, as I have termed, a very solid, relative realism, born from that. It made people really feel and believe in the future of Gundam. Here, almost a decade later in CCA, that commitment is on full display, but the level of visual fidelity which really must have wowed audiences then, and still does very much now. As a perfect example, CCA features what is, to the best of my knowledge, the earliest mass media depiction of an O'Neill colony cylinder using 3D CG rendering, created for really any kind of media. These shots, with their slightly choppy albeit frame rate, are still beautifully well done. Now to me they feel very much imbued with a nostalgic sense of portrayal of the future. Art director Shigemi Ikeda specifically mentions that in comparison to the shows, the movie should have the mirror-like petals of the colony be truly reflective. This would have been difficult to execute for a TV program. Interestingly, Ikeda visited New York for the city sequence to make it feel dense and lived in. Tomino mentioning that he wanted the mirrors to be white, but it looks like the mirrors because it reflects the sunlight, insisted Ikeda. Now this is maybe more of a personal theory, but I think the cinematic wide aspect ratio likely also helped enhance these effects. One day I hope to test this theory by seeing CCA in a theater. Please do a limited premiere in Canada Bandai, I missed the US one, please 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 please. Hidetoshi Omori, one of the seven animation directors who mainly focused on the small details and effects, has a lot of interesting comments. One that stands out is his commitment that, an explosion in outer space, basically, it should be going in circles. Director Tomino also told me that he didn't want to emit smoke, so I thought about making the sphere of light fade out. Okay, it's, it's a bit garbled by the translation, but Omori is commenting that yes, in space, you don't get the billowy explosions you do on Earth. You just get expanding spheres. Now, is CCA's explosions the most realistic ever? No, that would just be a white, poofy sphere. But it's a good example of a great stylistic consideration of realism being used to build a consistent, relative realism internally. Speaking of Omori from that same 4K booklet interview, he also mentions his work on the other details like the beam sabers. Omori. I didn't want to make the beam sabers cut like they'd look like they do in Star Wars. So when the Sazabis and Gundam Sabers meet in the end, I made them round. When the beams interfere with each other, they become energy balls, or fields. The next moment, depending on which one has the higher output, the energy ball, or field, would disappear. Based on that flow, I included the idea that it might be possible to disconnect the other person in the setting. Amori's seti, that is, the style sheets or guides, show a ton of attention to detail. Everything from the explosions, to the launch of missiles, to the way mobile suits should explode, weapons should impact armor, or the way beam weapons should emit these big energetic clouds of light and destruction. Unlike in Star Wars, where lightsabers have a very set edge, in CCA the details Amori provided help give the sabers and beam shots the feel of a contained plasma in a polarized field expanding instead. This is distinct as well from Star Wars' use of World War II gun cam tracer rounds as a reference for its blasters and lasers. Both seem similar, but the details of the specific execution help to flavor CCA apart. Um, Archibald. If that is so, why do the beam sabers use lightsaber noises? And the beam rifles sometimes make blaster sounds? 
Uh, well, um, okay, well, my best guess is really Conan's best guess. Namely, that, um, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but somewhere along the line, a bunch of Star Wars sound effects were packaged. That package was then sold around Hollywood, and sampled by other stuff, such as people who knew each other, that kind of thing, such as in Disney's Black Hole. Then, at some point, uh, perhaps due to the production of the Transformers show, creating a kind of Japan-US production link, it was brought over and then samples permeated around the anime world in the 80s until finding their way to Gundam. Uh, I cannot 100% confirm this, but yeah, if you're wondering about why there are Star Wars sounds in Char's counterattack, the most likely reason is to blame Transformers. Returning to the relative realism CCA embraces, the small reaction thrusters on the mobile suits are another great example. These small RCS, or reaction control thrusters, helping the mobile suits rotate, pitch, and roll in the dynamic combat of the movie. These are based on very real spacecraft technology. RCS thrusters have been installed on quite a number of real-life spacecraft, and you can find many references of them in use. Starting in Zeta, CCA has them so consistently used it's really quite impressive. You honestly have to slow down some of the footage just to catch them. It isn't something the camera lingers on to highlight, it's just an expected mechanical detail of the space combat. Really, in not highlighting it, and just having them flash by so quickly, it's kind of more impressive. As a like, yeah duh, that's how it works here, bub, approach. Another fantastic example of this is the use of base jabbers as a booster phase for launching mobile suits. One of the biggest things a lot of SF gets wrong is something that I could sum up as the mass ratio issue. Basically, most vehicles in science fiction, space fighters and ships, use models based on earthbound vehicles. That being, unsurprisingly, fighter planes and naval ships. On Earth, these vehicles only have to make up a relatively small amount of their internal volume with fuel. This is why the internal layouts of most space fiction are almost always directly inspired by this. Even the Expanse ships suffer from the same issue, it's mostly just empty space for the crew. In space, space space though, the problem is everything is incredibly far apart. And duh, in space. So any actual space vehicle ends up being mostly propellant by volume. Not exactly fuel in the Earth sense, you don't have any air to burn out there, but you can think of it as propellant. Even advanced fusion ships would benefit from a very high mass ratio being mostly comprised of fuel or, you know, propellant. Here, Gundam and CCA in particular show this off well. The spaceships have these gigantic, uh, I'm gonna say mass containment fuel spheres, things, all worked into them. And then for the mobile suits, while well, them themselves are not very mass efficient, Amuro does need to take a booster from the moon to travel. Later on, the Federation and Xeon units use base jabbers as that booster phase. The Alpha I-0 has two gigantic booster drop tanks. It shows a consideration of the limitations of the fictional machines. So, once again, is this the most realistic setup? No. But, it is a consistent use of internal rules to generate a great relative realism for the audience. Yes, it is that, absolutely. As perhaps one more great example carried over from Zeta, is the use of the dummy balloons as a major strategy. In real life, the military use of inflatable dummy targets has been in practice for pretty much over a hundred years, as a way of tricking long-distance observation. Internally, as Gundam's Minovsky reactors emit radar jamming particles, this means ships and mobile suits and their targeting computers must rely on visual pattern recognition. Which leads us back to... Ta-da! Spoofing them with dummy balloons. In fact, the central point of the plot and the central strategy is based around just this. It really adds something else I mentioned in the first and previous videos. A sense of military relative realism as well. The general vehicles as well speak to this in spades. Warship defense guns are actually dangerous for once. Crazy! Even the strategy of hiding a limited amount of nuclear missiles inside a larger barrage. There is a fantastic sense of applied military realism as well, within CCA. Strategy and counter-strategy. Attack and, um, well, you know, counter-attack. Both sides really give off this air that they are just trying everything and trying it to their best in order to win. Speaking of those vehicles as well, I do really want to mention that... Oh! Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness, radiators! Beautiful radiators! But who could be responsible for such a detailed inclusion? 
Oh, it was Gynax. That's right, including once more, Hideaki Anno. I told you he would come up again in the previous videos. From the 4K booklet discussion between Hideaki Anno and Itaka Izabuchi. Izabuchi. Was Gynax asked to do all the mechanical work because Mr. Okada, Toshio, accepted the job? Anno. That's what I hear. Producer Kenji Uchida contacted Mr. Okada of Gynax, and it was decided that Mr. Shoichi Masuo and I would be the main people working on it as a company. My only condition for accepting the job was if Semi Tanaka would be doing cleanup. The main focus is on ships, with Mr. Masuo as the Federation side and me in Neo Zeon. So our roles are divided. Izabuchi. Was it Osada, Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, with the spacesuits? Ano. Oh, I think Mr. Sadamoto drew the rough sketch for the spacesuits. Also, I drew many things other than Neo Zeon ships. This include the cockpit of the mobile suits, shackles and the base jabber, Neo Zeon's harbor patrol boat, the colony laser cannon, Amaro's Eleka and linear train, and the headset used by Amaro. Also the shuttle that first appears. However, somewhere along the way, we started receiving orders for things like meal trays, and Mr. Okada decided that the budgeted design had already been completed and refused any further work. So the work ended midway through production. This is pretty fascinating, as Ano and Okada, along with Gainax boys, were obviously very big space nerds. In particular, Ano's drawings and his inspirations coming from works like the Jerry Anderson shows, such as Space 1999 and UFO themselves drawing inspiration from the post-2001 slash Apollo realism of the 70s. And we can see that, really, a lot in the designs Gynax did. The previously mentioned large edition radiators, the must for any realism concerned spacecraft, along with the very large notable propellant tanks I mentioned, which really give a strong sense of that consideration for the mass ratio that space demands. The space planes and Really, all the various small craft and supporting roles as well show this off fantastically. So, in general, both the relative realism of CCA is, as you should now see, pretty great. Both the components of the military and space realism contributing to that wonderfully. It's got a bit of Star Wars noises, some very post-2001 70s Jerry Anderson vehicle design, and a heap of Zeta Gundam's little details. All coming together to bring the sense of CCA's war to life. What it definitely is, is 100% Gundam. Now, for one last lighter section before we drop down into the tragedy. This is of course, the weapon vehicle, which is also at the epicenter of the space war realism. The iconic vehicle which represents that human-shaped conflict. The mobile suits. The mobile suits of Char's counterattack have something going on which really isn't too hard to notice. After the radical changes of Zeta's emphasis on transforming mobile suits, forms which were strange, abstract, and shifting in their details, geometry, and design, after Double Zeta's massive hulks pushing nigh on 30 meters, packed with weapons and towering in their power and emphasis on firepower and girth, CCA instead featured a bit of a reactionary backswing. Indeed, if you cut out Zeta and Double Zeta's developments of mobile suits and draw a straight line from 0079 to CCA, it actually kind of makes sense. Only the addition of some elements like funnels, beam weapons for Neo Zeon, dummy balloons and launchers, and Zeta's reaction control system thrusters betray this otherwise full counter-revolutionary approach to mobile suit design and mechanical design in general. Really. Back to Basics sums it up pretty well. One primary weapon, one melee weapon, head Vulcans, and the consistent integration of missile launchers make up the bulk of the mobile suit's equipment. We have returned mostly to where Mobile Suit Gundam left off in 1981. Indeed, adding those RCS thrusters and dummy balloon launchers backwards onto the One Year War feels like such a natural fit, it should be no surprise later works like Igloo and The Origin would do just that. Of course, this is by no means coincidental. Yutaka Izabuchi's intention was just that. CCA would be the first work helmed front and center by his mechanical design. After contributing on Zeta and Double Zeta, and first working with Tomino on Zabungle and Dunbine. As Izabuchi comments from his Forbes interview remarking on the Nagano curse and the tight timing. Izabuchi. With Shar's counterattack, another person was originally dealing with both projects, specifically Mamoru Nagano, nicknamed Chris. He was working on those. 
I believe that Tamuyo-san really wanted to work with Nagano-san on these. However, I think there was a problem on the sponsor side. It's difficult to be sure, as I wasn't involved in the project at that stage. The comments I heard were that sponsors thought the anime would not be popular with Nagano-san's designs. He was then taken off of the project. As a result, the production had already started. They had to find a mecha design replacement in a short period of time. I have a vague recollection of some kind of competition, and in the end I ended up on the project. Looking back on it with the memory I have now, I'm not sure how short the time was on having to design the mobile suits for Shard's counterattack. All I do remember is that I had very little time. It felt like I didn't have a full one month on it, but my memory on this is a bit sketchy. Interestingly, he comments that maybe in fact it was this lack of time which perhaps reduced such strong designs by necessity. While I had very little time on Shard's counterattack to design the mobile suits, if I had had more time, I would have probably overthought the designs and they probably wouldn't have turned out differently or not as good. As to the particular designs, we come back to that idea of back to the original Gundam, as Tamino laid out as a goal of the mobile suits in Char's counterattack. The CCA official complete works has many interesting comments relating to that in the mechanical design section. The comments from Izabuchi, as well as other comments from Koichi Inoue, Yoshinori Sayama, and Shigeru Horiguchi all of which contributed and are often overlooked for their efforts. Izabuchi. For the Ghiradoga, I intended an updated version of the Zaku 2. I designed the shooting process of the Ghiradoga's Sturmfaust, but in the end it was shot like an ordinary missile in the film. As for the Jigen, several designers participated, such as Masahisa Suzuki and Koichi Ohada, ultimately getting finished up by Izabuchi, as a successor to the GM visually. Izabuchi mentions, in the Jigen design, producer Uchida said that the waist armor is unnecessary. I followed that request, but it became so similar to the Ingram from Pat Lover. Tomino requested a big thruster, so Sunrise's in-house team developed it, and Masahisa Suzuki drew the sketch. Izabuchi. In the beginning, I didn't like the name Psycho Doga. I wrote Yagdoga on the sketch. Then it was adopted. It was difficult to depict their metal reflection in anime back then. I regret that part. I read the story and thought that the weapon Quest should use to kill her father should be cruel, so I designed the Gatling gun. For the Zeta Gundam, inspired Re GZ, Izabuchi only did the rough sketch before leaving final design to Koichi Ohada. He also, however, mentions that Masahisa Suzuki did a draft and that Yoshinori Sayama polished it up, and the final design is that which we see in the movie. As for the monstrous Alpha I Zero, it actually came from Izabuchi himself. He says, Izabuchi. In Tomino's idea, Quest was supposed to keep piloting the Psycho Doga. I wanted a giant monster-like antagonist, so I voluntarily designed the Alpha Zero. I also proposed using it as the Psycho Doga in the memo. The inspiration source is the Zeon. This has some big symbolic and thematic implications, but, you know, we'll get back to those later. Continuing on, we arrive at Char's now iconic Sazabi. Itself another example of the back to the original mindset. Izabuchi. Sazabi was named Zanak when I started the design. I had the successor of the Dom or Gelgoog in my mind. The head design is based on Char's helmet. I had too little time to check the size of the Sazabi cockpit. The size inconsistency is noticeable. I really regret it, but I had no time to check it. The simple cylinder shape of the funnel is not that interesting, so I added the cover opening gimmick. So yes, Izabuchi was very aware about the size thing. Chalk that up to the tight production schedule. Izabuchi elaborated on the naming issue and the timing in his Forbes interview much later. I think the original name for the Sazabi was something like Xanak, but due to the trademark rights we couldn't use that name. That meant it had to be changed to something else. So they picked Sazabi. That said, there was already an apparel company called Sazabi, and I joke this would probably be a bigger issue in the long run. In the original Mobile Suit Gundam there is a mobile armor called the Elmith but when they did the first Gunpla kits of that, they couldn't just use the name on its own. So this was all to do with naming and trademark rights. In terms of timing, I designed Sazabi first. The reason for this is because I had to finish all my work before the animation production commenced. This of course leads us to the real star of CCA, the new Gundam. The name I is of course a pun on the Greek naming scheme of the previous Gundam works, itself coming from that Alpha Gundam slash Zeta Gundam proposal created for what would become Zeta. So, the Greek letter, in lowercase, you know, looks like a V, but is phonetically new, like the English word new, 
so we get New Gundam. Get it? Huh? Get it? Pretty clever, right? Now, here people often only credit Izabuchi. Many people submitted proposals for the main Gundam, but a collaborative effort would end up shaping it. Direct Tomino had two big requests regarding the new Gundam. I want to put a cape on the Gundam, and I don't want the Gundam itself to transform or combine. This really shuns or discards even 0079's combining core fighter aspect, which is weird to think about as it's something so many main character Gundams retain. Shigeru Horiguchi would have the solution on how to integrate a cape. Shigeru Horiguchi. I had confidence in my funnel idea being like a folding bamboo screen. Tomino immediately adopted it. Inoue noting, when the fin funnel idea was turned into the isometric cape on the shoulder, they developed a model with a 160 Gundam gunpla and cardboard. I think this is arguably a fantastic example of a director's demand becoming a cool realization with the visions and talents of the artists involved. Tomino made many specific requests of the designs in CCA, including small elements like the asteroid grabbing foot hooks on the mobile suit's feet. Now as someone who praised the diversity of designs in Zeta, this may surprise some folks when I say that CCA perhaps has my favorite lineup of mobile suits in Gundam. Like, individually, they are all great, but as a whole, they are extremely polished and consistent. While other shows, OVAs, and films have great designs I love really to death, there is virtually no stinkers in CCA. Every single design mechanically, from the enemy suits to the allies, all feel visually distinct but synchronized. This consistent design language being a product of that really focused, tight deadline and goal for sure. The Sazabi is really cool. <laughs> the new Gundam is also really cool, both feeling like the full fruition of Shar and Amuro's previous mobile suits. The Mook Jigans and the Giradoga are really sick. Lined up with the wonderful spacecraft from the talented Gynax folks like Anno, it gives CCA one of the best overall styles and machine design languages for just how to the point it all is. There's no fat to speak of. It's the kind of thing you just, you know, you want to get like a big Lego set with the, you know, all the bad guys and the good guys and they have, you know, spaceships and you know, just want to collect everything. Another point is several years ago, I made a video commenting on the parallel of mecha science fiction and the desired honorable form of combat reminiscent of World War I's early dogfights. And check that custom emblem out! On Amaro's new and Shar Sazabi. See? This is what I'm talking about, baby. It's funny to think, in retrospect, neither existed or were used before CCA. If there is one more comment I'd return to, it's from Anno's proposal for his new Gundam. I don't want to dwell too much on the design itself. Izabuchi described it as just being the RX-78 with a long head. And, well, um, it's an RX-78 with a long head. What interests me more is his comments from the 4K booklet on that design. Anno. I wanted to go back to the amount of lines used in the first Gundam. It's a shame that the number of lines suddenly increased during Zeta Gundam. And at that time, I was really filled with a righteous indignation, thinking, we need to reduce the number of lines. My feeling is that industrial products are becoming simpler and simpler. So when I look at Zeta Gundam show and Gundam Zeta mobile suit, or vice versa, whatever it is, I get the feeling that mobile suits are actually going backwards technologically. Also, as an animator, it's difficult to work with things that have a lot of lines. So I end up having to show them in still pictures and end up drawing them, which doesn't make it interesting to move them. I understand how that feels. Back in the days of First Gundam, Mr. Yasuhiku animated mobile suits as characters, and I think the appropriate amount of lines was a good thing. So even though it was a, you know, theater, I would be difficult to draw that many lines, so I submitted a Gundam with fewer lines. The reason I bring this up is because, in a funny way, Despite his designs not being selected, Anno did very much tap into what I feel to be the spirit of what made CCA's mechanical design work and be so strong. Namely, a focus on returning to basics and succinct design. Anno would also carry through these ideas in his Evangelions much later. The new Gundam is a really cool design, but it is also quite simple when you really boil it down. It's a new RX-78. It has a bazooka, a powerful beam rifle, a beam saber, Head Vulcans. It's very simple. Its biggest additions are some missiles and its shield and the funnels. But even Gundam's fanciest psychically controlled weapons are finite. 
Char and Amaro have only less than a dozen each, not the seemingly endless swarms of the Elmith, Quebli, or Double Zeta's monstrosities. They pull off a handful of dramatic moves, but are not that terrifying weapon of mass destruction that they were in 0079. This focus on do it simple, but do it well, with the added and small details of the emblems, Zeta's RCS, and dummy balloons, it all comes together to paint a very fully refined version of the giant nuclear battle armor that sprung from that combination of Starship Troopers and Toyetic design almost 10 years previously. To end the stories of Shar and Amaro by returning to the central conflict of 0079, by returning to the central humanoid mechanical warriors, now enhanced and made new for the big screen. With that note, we now must turn to the tragedy of those two. But really, the tragedy of our history as well. In the first video in this series, I stated the history of Japan leading up to the context of the creation of Gundam. I'm sure some folks wondered why. Of course, it served that video's fleshed out context, for why Gundam's first series was a success. But really, it also served as a vital context right here and now in this video as well. When 0079 was created, Japan, like much of the world in the 1970s, was experiencing a severe post-war withdrawal, a reconstruction that had given Japan a sense of purpose and wealth. Technology, innovation, and a higher standard of living was slowing down. The Japanese miracle, the Japanese economic miracle, was slowly ending. As it cooled, it revealed a disparity in that wealth, a disparity in the fabric of Japan. Nothing more perfectly embodies this than what the first video mentioned, and now comes finally, fully into play. The Sun Rizuka struggle. The nation of Japan, and Tokyo in particular, desiring a new expanded airport, selected Narita as its location. It was chosen because it was open, of course, but it was also chosen because the impoverished farmers who had lived there for generations were seen as easy to buy out and force off of their lands. It should come as no surprise that this was a flashpoint. The class tension soared, as the disparity between Tokyo, the wealthy expanding capital, and the impoverished rural workers were seen as a battleground for the young leftists as a movement of Japan. Even though many of those leftists also came from urban centers, a lot of them, like Yoshikazu Yasuhiku, were students that had come from an impoverished background but had moved to the big city. These groups banded together and formed the Sanrizuka Shibuyama United Opposition League. For virtually every stage of the airport's construction, they mounted some form of opposition. To just lay the foundation piles for the airport, the construction company had to have a 1,500-man armed escort to breach the site. From then, they occupied the land, built a kind of makeshift fort, which the government had to lay siege to, sending almost 2,000 riot police to gain control. The imagery was right out of the Sengoku Jidai. The leftist opposition had rallies where over 17,000 protesters gathered, as the government continued to evict and construct the airport. It would end up opening in 1978. 0079 would come out just one year later, but time, and the struggle, was not over. Japan's booming 80s decade had done little to stifle the ongoing tensions that had been broiling since the 60s. Nothing climaxed the events of the Sanrizuka struggle like the Crossroads engagement. In what can no longer be called really a riot, it is instead verging on outright military operation. The opposition planned one massive final struggle. First, a gigantic coordinated diversionary struggle was carried out. Protesters gathered and attacked riot police, with what I can only say is impressive coordination. They used battering rams to break through the riot police shields and flung bricks, Molotov cocktails, and rocks, managing to destroy a SWAT van with its water cannon in the process. However, as I already mentioned, this was just a distraction. While this was happening, opposition members lit fires in the Narita airport terminal, forcing an evacuation. When emergency services were called, they rolled out their secret weapon. A fake fire truck with a built-in flamethrower instead of a water cannon. Opposition members clad in firefighter uniforms stormed into the tower and lit smaller fires while smashing out windows with pachinko ball shotguns. In the end, their secret weapon failed. The fire truck's flamethrower broke down. The airport, Bruised, burnt, and temporarily out of commission was still standing. The year was 1985. The same as Ada Gundam. While the riot police were humiliated, it was a Pyrrhic victory. Though casualties were kept to a minimum, and surprisingly there is no fatalities from this event, the extreme action finally swayed public sentiment enough 
that in conjunction with the crimes, the government broke the back of the opposition movement. Over a hundred arrests, including those of key opposition leaders, were made. The government lists the name as the 20th October Narita Local Conflict. The leftists prefer calling it the Uprising of 85. While some farmers were allowed to go on living awkwardly squished inside the growing airport, it was not the would-be revolution envisioned. And in the end, that was that. The final counterattack of the Narita Troubles, but really, the grand climax of Japan's student-driven leftist movement as a whole. It was not totally wiped out, but it likewise has never recovered. The effects of this movement, the effects of the struggle, permeate anime. The opening riot in Oshi's Jinro evokes it. Both Hayao Miyazaki and Yoshikazu Yasuhiku were both members of the larger movement at points, but then, by the time that it occurred, they were firmly within the animation industry, and it could be argued this event founded their cynicism around leftism going forward. This also isn't to say that leftism in Japan as a whole was absolutely deleted off the map. Japan still has essentially the oldest still present communist party in a quote, Western democracy, having been founded 101 years ago. But the notion of a student-driven revolution had crested, crashed, and dissipated. In the end, the Japanese capitalism the student leftists hated so much would see its decline by its own devices. Just one year after CCA was made, in the late 80s and early 90s, the Japanese bubble cracked and began to burst. Due to a number of complex economic factors, Japanese banks crapped out loans to everyone and anyone. Bad credit? No problem. You want to start a business? Here's a wad of cash. It had spiked housing prices and inflation. In 1989, attempting to curb this, the Bank of Japan raised the interest rates on interbank lending. This attempted slowing imploded things. The stock market crashed, leaving banks with massive ledgers full of loans with debts, debts with millions of people who could not pay them off. Japan lost a trillion dollars of value over the subsequent decade. And to this day, while not as desperate economically, has never truly recovered. The lost decade of the 90s became the lost 20 years of the 2000s, becoming the lost 30 years of the 2010s. In this way, the supreme irony of Japan's post-war boom, born from a combination of an advancement, investment, a population spike, all of it was defeated by itself. Both the radical student leftism and the Japanese hyper-capitalist post-war liberal democracy were, in the end, their own worst enemies. This, this is the context on which Char's counterattack was made. Beyond the beautiful animation of mobile suits, Behind the wonderful renders of space colonies, CCA sits at the climax of both the liberal, democratic, capitalist, economic, post-war Japanese reconstruction, and the leftist, student-driven extremism and rebellion. In CCA's setting, I can't not see a parallel. The bureaucratic, inept Earth Federation government, now satisfied after having won against Zeon, Haman's Neo-Zeon, and having survived the Titans, pathetically seeks easy ways to avoid any more post-war problems. A liberal, democratic, one-world government, happy to remain in control while never solving the very problems which it caused. The problems which created the conditions which gave rise to the fascist Zeon. And against them, the Neo-Zeon forces of Shar Aznal, exploiting these very same issues. The dissatisfaction of the Spacenoid populations against that government to enable its one final extremist operation its one final counter-attack, to decimate the Earth by dropping the resource asteroids in orbit onto it, the same ones that were used to construct the colonies, causing a nuclear winter and annihilating the power of the Federation, even at the cost of possibly billions of dead. Hideaki Anno and Mamoru Oshii, when interviewed and commenting on CCA, picked up on and talk a great deal about just this part of the movie. So, whether or not you like the movie, is probably decided by the kind of reaction you have to hearing lines like correction, or purge, or heavenly punishment. Since there's bound to be many people who have dislike with words like that, especially older people, when they react to purge and correction. For the pre-war faction, correction meant military lynchings and riots. And for people after the 70s, correction means demonstrations, political radicals, or controlled riots or lynchings. There's also the Japanese Red Army issue as well. If it were a movie, they may not have been bothered by it, but since it's an animation, 
there is this gap between the raw human intentions and the drawn world, and that actually makes a bigger impact. So for people who dislike seeing undiluted emotion show up on screen, they just can't do it. This is what I meant by my frustration. The frustration with CCA. The first is that this movie is just so specific a political commentary. It's not surprising I don't feel many get CC on this level, because they simply either dismiss it as a fancy toy commercial, or only really ever take it in as that surface level. As Oshi himself says, On one hand, I felt that this movie could only be accepted by people like that. The older folks just thought it was bad. People in the anime industry especially. And for younger folk, they didn't know how to process an undiluted political world like that one. Despite all of this, the theaters were pretty full. And that's probably due to the influence of Gundam. Even so, I was impressed that a script like CCA was greenlit. How could they release something like that? Probably because they weren't watching it very seriously. Everyone is so enchanted by the surface level space war aspect, but there's very few people who accurately grasp Mr. Tomino's intentions. But this is the second meaning of my frustration. The reason so few get it. The first frustration is caused by this second original frustration within CCA as a work. The political frustration with the world. Oshi comments on just this and draws yet more parallels to the context I mentioned. The idea itself is not anything exceptional. It doesn't come up to the surface, but to exaggerate, this is about present day. But as a phenomenon, in Japan, maybe after the 70s, perhaps. Among the political ideas that collapsed in the 60s was a type of retaliation ideology. There's a bit of nihilism in it. But basically, because there existed a political thought that placed its basis on the idea that humans are no good. However, that never made its way into the mainstream, much less in a world like animation the center of popular culture. The fact that it showed up so suddenly was a surprise. It was almost pure literature. To want to retaliate against humanity, or want to correct humanity. Truth be told, I also had similar thoughts. Oshi here is definitely talking also about a parallel in his Pat Lever the Movie 2, which I will get to at some point. But to get back to that main point, this idea of an undiluted political source. This, to me, is both the origin of the frustration, but also the supreme irony about CCA. I find Ideon's final two movies, A Contact and Be Invoked, works where, quite literally, everyone dies. Women, children, everyone, <laughs> only to be reborn. Feels like a positively optimistic and, you know, it feels brimming with possibility, in contrast to CCA's brutal, cynical, political reality. The systems we live under are imperfect, and the alternatives put into action are at best flawed, and at worst extremist. Now is Tomino advocating for some grand centrism? Some both sides approach? Hell, is Char's counterattack even literally about just leftism? Or Marxism? Or communism? After all, in the post-war period, Japan also grappled with neo-nationalism as well. Funnily enough, I think the answer is just no. It isn't. It's a story born from reality, and the reality of Japan at the time was simply two bad options. Two failures. I think even outside of Japan, there are people living, living in a great deal of places. The United States, Argentina, South Korea, over Asia, Africa, Europe, the Americas. All over the world who politically face this Catch-22 every day, affecting their lives, their loved ones. Elections with bad, centrist, neoliberal, or neoconservative options and bad, populist-driven extreme options. It's that lingering, painful relevance Gundam has to our world. I think it's also funny in the first video how much Tomino mentioned that anime should not be literature. It should not have this kind of undiluted core. When in this final conclusion, he would basically channel just that. Interestingly enough, Hideaki Anno is impressed with Tomino's very resolve to do that within CCA, to portray this. Anno. Anime is a method of expressions very infantile, especially facial expressions. Angry faces have raised eyebrows, crying faces have tears in their eyes. Blurry pupils means they're crying. If a foreigner saw this, I don't think they'd understand. Japanese people are trained to understand to some extent, so they know, oh, they're crying right now. However, when the character is crying because they are happy or because they are sad, it cannot be understood through just the art, without dialogue and the whole package. So whether hands go flying or blood is shed, at the end of the day, they're all animated cell humans. Even if they speak, it's just three frames of mouths going open and close. 
I think the sincere attitude of trying to go so far through such a childish means of expression in an even more remote region of robot anime is amazing. I didn't think there were any directors like this until now. Part of me genuinely wonders if Anno Scene CCA is what inspired him to tackle the themes he did in Nadia unsuccessfully, and then very successfully in Evangelion, even using this juvenile method of expression. Oshi further notes just how difficult it is to use this kind of heavy political language in a world like Gundam, a mecha anime. Oshi. It's dangerous. Danger is not about being socially sanctioned, criticized, or denounced, but rather straightforward words, suggesting revolution, intellectuals this and that, and correcting or imposing sanctions on humankind. If you're not careful about it, the intentions may be flipped on you. In other words, you run the risk of becoming a gag. Political language is rather delicate, isn't it? If you do it too much, like those violent student protesters who often appear in TV dramas, it becomes a comedy act that's so ugly you can't even call it a parody. In short, political language is very delicate. Going back to that phrase, heavenly punishment, I'm positive that there's people who laughed at that phrase, because we're talking heavenly punishment in a space environment. What he's doing, Tomino, is describing the February 26th incident, verbatim, but the world he's created is a future battlefield in outer space. There's an immense gap. The younger generation may not care about it, though. There's some stuff as well we will return to for that one later. But for now, one last superb quote really sums up everything from Oshi and Anno, and in a lot of my personal frustrations as well. Oshi. So when I saw CCA, I thought, there are definitely people out there who got together to drink and laugh out loud while watching this movie. And those who didn't said they couldn't bear to watch it and stop watching, since they immediately develop a dislike for it, and the people who watched it seriously are hardcore robot fans or Gundam fans. He's speaking very sincerely, but depending on what kind of world and audience see this movie, it will become a very unfortunate movie. Ano, oh, I think that movie is so one-sided though, I can't imagine that they had the audience in mind while he was making it. Oshi, well there was a sense of agitation, there's no way you'll understand. Anno. Oh, I get that sense from the fighting spirit of the film. The funniest part about that, the movie was clearly the director getting his political frustrations out on the big screen selfishly, is this interview from the movie booklet back in 88. After all, says Tomino, a movie shouldn't be based on just one staff member's ideas. <laughs> With the movie first, there's the audience, and then there are the investors and the other directors. It must be made with the help of many people, including animators, art directors, voice actors, and recording staff. If it is made according to the preferences of a single person, that's not the way to make a film. But even so, in the end, the movie is a product of the director's will, and it cannot be said that it belongs to the director. Finding that balance is what makes a movie interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with Oceanano here. CCA is very much Tomino, selfishly taking Gundam's conclusion for a very purposeful ride, as a canvas to fill out his personal and political and societal frustrations. And as someone who gets that frustration, and who has felt it myself, I think it's a 100% worthwhile effort. It makes CCA a powerfully unique work. An extremely unique climax. But to really show you why I get it, yes, that historical context helps a lot. But the best way to close out this section is to put my personal cards on the table here. Because I hope, if all else fails, if the historical context, reactions from Tomino's contemporaries, if all of that fails to help you understand, listening to this, Hopefully, this will shed some light. About a decade ago, I was going through high school. I was really getting into Gundam. And, for the first time, I watched Char's Counterattack. To me at that time, it was very much a work about cool robots in a nostalgic war in the heavens. The animation and battles wowed me. That's what I loved. In the third year of high school, however, I happened to take a philosophy class. Ironically, no, it wasn't the teacher of the curriculum that did much but I happened to sit beside someone I had not met in my first two years. He was a person who had just had an unfortunate personal tragedy in his life. His recuperation, his great mental medication, which pulled him out of that, was leftism. He immersed himself in Marxist thought and activism. I, by sheer coincidence, was bored, and had never truly understood what any of that really meant. By cosmic coincidence, my seat was beside his. By then, I had already cultivated an interest in politics, but my feelings towards the subjects were almost completely neutral. I was no hyper-rich, upper-class tanky, guilty over my parents' wealth, 
nor was I some poor, lower-class, anti-capitalist filled with resentment. My squarely middle-class upbringing had been mostly apolitical. From this starting point, we talked. We talked quite a lot. Our class was just before lunch, and we would go and eat at a German restaurant nearby. In retrospect, it was a, like a bit of historical roleplay, like we were two European intellectuals in the 1910s. Well, that or they had great schnitzel for like seven bucks, with rice. So, okay, that might have been the actual reason. Either way, the years rolled by. High school ended, but I stayed in contact. Trump's presidency began, and the political atmosphere grew tense. I attended large gatherings of leftists, town halls, charge debates, Christmas parties. Our generation was, and still is, growing more politically active in the face of our dire worldly circumstances. I loved just how critical Marxist theory could be. Of everything. The whole system. Neither liberal nor conservative views were willing to rail against the truths that Marxism did. And then, after a few years of university, I just stopped attending. There was no breaking point, really. No Sanrizuka struggle which disgusted me. I didn't, and still have not grown, to wholly embrace and celebrate capitalism, either. I just sort of drifted out. I can't think of another way to describe it. It may have simply been the huge gap between the very real problems and the scale of political action needed for a revolution to occur. Or it may have been simply meeting all those people with such strong leftist ideals, who mostly end up still working and in their own small way maintaining the system as a whole. That kind of faith in the permanent revolution which never arrives. Even Char's counterattack itself, as insane a political statement as it is under it all, was also a commercial entity as all large-scale art is. This ability of modern capitalism to assume all ideas, even subversive ones, into itself. It was a combination of all these things which made me, and in the end, feel quite disillusioned, and turned me into the political cynic I am today. Not wholly unlike exactly what Amaro describes towards the climax of this film. Rewatching Char's counterattack now reminds me of all this. Ten years later, and I know very much, really, what Tomino was putting down. What Oshi and Anno were impressed or even intimidated by. The blunt political frustration of it all. I feel it and I am both amazed that a commercial franchise like Gundam had this be its seemingly final chapter, and slightly nauseated by that very frustration it channels oh so well. I never called myself a Marxist, I never felt comfortable saying I was a communist. Even while many of my political views are certainly leftist, I just never felt the genuine, absolute belief the people at those gatherings held within them. The belief in this revolution. The kind of conviction that could draw me to participate in something like the Narita airport riots. As much as I respect the coordination and the cause. Tomino as well, I think, experienced this. When he mentioned how he avoided the sphere of leftism his classmates and co-workers like Yasuhiku embraced. Sorry if this isn't some satisfying grand conclusion, but much like Char's counterattack, there is no satisfying political fruition. Reality doesn't triumph, history doesn't end. The last farmers were evicted from Narita Airport this very year. Neither my personal experience nor Char's counterattack are about an ideal conclusion, a political climactic solution. Simply a reality of two bad options. The limping, liberal, democratic rump state of the Federation, and the desperate, fatalist extreme of Neo Zeon, reaching a tragic, frustrated breaking point. But hopefully now, at the very least, you understand CCA's politics, and also why most people did not. How Tomino felt and how I felt. The frustration remains, but with that, we move on. We now arrive, really, at the actors within this tragic, frustrated breaking point. Amaro and Char, the cast of the film. Let me begin by saying that the kind of jarring joints of Double Zeta Gundam's ends and beginnings work both ways. As much as Double Zeta Gundam's existence likely caused a tonal car crash out of Zeta's transition to Double Zeta, Double Zeta's inability to recover the financial success is what caused CCA to take the form it did. But here as well, the joining is awkward. Amaro's joining of Londo Bell, Char's turn to embracing Neo Zeon after fighting along the Ayug, even the origin and nature of Char's Neo Zeon as a whole. Sadly, all of these things would have been explained in an ideal world, inside Gundam's Part 3. But Gundam Double Zeta is pretty much dismissed in its entirety by a single line from Char during his speech at Sweetwater. 
itself a colony featured previously, but also likewise transformed for its central place in CCA's story. This leads to really the main obvious fact. CCA, in many ways, picks up as a direct continuation and resolution of where Shar and Amuro stood at the end of 0079. Even other elements like those from Zeta are not seriously considered really. None stand out more prominently than Beltorchica. Beltorchica was Amuro's primary love interest in Zeta, the one who motivated his participation with the AU. She is such an obvious feeling missing element, it's no wonder Tomino included her centrally in this novel version. Now I don't want to linger too much on what ifs, alternate tellings, and so on, as this series is about the main animated entries. But Tomino did comment on just this, from the 88 movie booklet. Interviewer. There have been three Mobile Suit Gundam series so far, but how does the new movie, Mobile Suit Gundam Shars Counterattack, position itself among these works? Tomino. Of course it's not unrelated. It follows Mobile Suit Gundam and Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. However, the story of Shars Counterattack was constructed to follow those in order, but not to inherit everything. By not everything, I mean things like, why is Belturchica Irma, who was in Zeta Gundam, not in this movie? In other words, it cannot be said that we followed the character placement perfectly. Why did we not follow it? Originally, it was something that had to be carried over, but when I wrote such a scenario at first, it was rejected. There's a good reason for this. If she were to appear, the story would become that of Amuro, and how he had apparently gotten married. In other words, the main character was either married or, he and Beltorchica, had been living together for a long time, and the companies involved questioned whether it would be appropriate to depict a robot anime with such a main character. I too thought that this doubt was quite natural. However, when I was actually planning Char's counterattack and writing the scenario, I couldn't come up with that much on my own. In other words, from the beginning, I assumed Beltorchica would be there, since the story follows from Gundam to Zeta, and then Char's counterattack. Even so, when I understood that it would not be suitable for her to appear in this film due to the concerns I mentioned earlier, I decided not to include her. Also, I made it so that there was absolutely no information about her in the film. If we had to go into all that detail, the movie would have quickly exceeded the two hour time frame. So, in essence, due to a combination of minding the length and keeping things concise, and sponsor meddling, Beltorchica did not appear. Ultimately, I would say it is something of an unfortunate turn of events, but understandable given the tight timeline and constraints. With that, it really does lead me to, as perhaps the other two obvious missing players. Namely, Camille Bidan and Sayla Mass. Both were incredibly important in interacting with and affecting the lives of Amuro and Char. But even with that in mind, for these ones, I'm more okay with their exclusion. For Sayla, her arc more or less completed with 0079. She didn't want to be a soldier, didn't want to be a big player, she didn't want to inherit the mantle of Zeon Daikun, nor lead a new type revolution. She just wanted to survive. Camille as well, though far more of a fighter and a warrior, had by the end of Zeta become the human sacrifice needed to save the Earth. His recovery in Double Zeta may have been Tomino motioning to a future involvement, but here as well the notion that he simply lived life happily with Fa is fine. You see, it's a concept I have come to understand as graduation. The graduation from the cycle of violence. It's something I admire a lot. You see, as an audience, we want drama, want struggle and entertainment. We grow attached to characters, want to see them fight and win over and over. But when thinking about writing from the perspective of those characters, the lives they live, this can be traumatic, endlessly filled with multiple lifetimes of war, murder and destruction. Especially in war stories like Gundam, if you treat characters as, ironically, real people, not just vehicles for escapist bloodshed, there are simply limits on what a person would want to endure. In this way, Frodo leaving to the Undying Lands, the Hound in A Song of Ice and Fire living with the priests after giving up the sword, Sela staying out of world events, even Camille living a humble life. I think these, while less dopamine satisfying for the audience, do more to respect the very real world limits on just how much ugliness people, or characters, should endure. One thing I do know, if Camille were here and saw how Char changed, he would punch him in the face so goddamn fucking hard. With that addressed, we can turn to the two tragic main actors, who very much did not escape that cycle of violence, Amuro and Char. There are some great excerpts here from the CCA official complete works, which have their voice actors, Furia and Ikeda, commenting. How was recording back then compared to the current situation? Furia. Back then we shared the same monitor and microphone. Ikeda. In those days, we couldn't get the footage DVD beforehand. It's recorded in the Tokyo TV Center, right? Furuya, I think so. Ikeda, one day recording? Furuya, 
My script says only roll 12 and 16 were recorded on another day. Ikeda. Suzuoki drinks even before recording, so maybe someone thought it was the best idea. Detective Conan movies are recorded in one day too. Furia. It's rare these days. Besides the time crunch, there is also some very funny input on their characters a little further on. Did you have any unexpected acting? Furia. I said, don't underestimate the new Gundam in a cool tone. But my acting in the film had a more bitter tone. Plus, the early part sounds too young. The interactions with Chan made it more mature. Ikeda, you are enjoying it with Mitsuki Yayoi. Furia, we were lovers, tee hee hee. Ikeda, I thought she was the first decent girlfriend for Amuro. Yayoi-chan didn't talk to me. Furia, though Torchika is not my type. But I like Chan. Ikeda, the knee-holding scene was nice. Furia, that scene brought out a more mature voice for me. Ikeda, Sakaki Bara played both Haman and Nanai, so I thought, Shar doesn't change. Furia, they're totally different characters. They may only be the voice actors, but I do think it's funny how well they know their characters. I do have to agree with Furia though, Beltorchika does kinda just dump her whole spiel on Amuro. Where Chan, it feels more natural a partner. With that we come to perhaps the critical aspects of their motivations here. Namely, Amuro and Char's conflict in this very film. For Amuro's part, his actions are all very reactive. Like his motivations in 0079 and his joining of the AU Zeta. Amuro is more so catching up with the world, rather than dictating it. As Furia commented, his dynamic with Bright was very blunt and to the point. Amuro has grown into his role as an ace pilot and matured so very much since the days of the One Year War. Bright, for his part, is really pretty much the same. This poor man who is constantly in charge of the people who need to save the Earth. Amuro, all the while, trying to love Chan, is haunted by Lala. The spiritual presence lingering over his life his reason for not wanting to return to space. The new type bond transcending death but in doing so dragging him along as a ghost distant in the land of the living. It's this tension he shares with Shar, which really brings me to the titular man himself, Shar. Shar in CCA is really quite a tragic figure. Shar, who is really Kasful Daikun, son to the philosopher-politician Zeon Daikun, has in this film grown into seemingly embracing the mantle of his Zeon blood. This is a stark continuation of 0079, where his motives were to avenge that blood by just killing the zombies. But they seem very jagged. Char ended Zeta Gundam talking about how he didn't want to lead humanity in the wrong direction, but now has embraced everything Haman temporarily helmed and more. The new type philosophy, the politics of Zeon. The cause of the space noid migrants. Sadly, Double Zeta's failure is felt here perhaps the sharpest. It really is left to the audience that Perhaps, the Ayug's failure and the deaths of so many comrades and young new types at grips are at Broke Shar. But one way or another, this is, all of it, a large front. While Shar wears the semblance of this Zeon lineage, over and over the movie shows us it's all a kind of selfish endeavor. What is really eating away at him as well, sorry if you didn't see this coming, is a killing frustration. A continuation of the frustration of 0079 and Zeta. Namely, Shar's inability to fruition into whatever his idea of a full new type would be. It's what personally motivates him underneath all the showy speeches and very killer uniform. It's a fundamentally dissatisfied person. It's the look he gives to Camille and Zeta when he seems to realize he has surpassed him. He blames Amaro for killing Lala, for cutting off the person he thought could have enabled this. But beyond that, he's still jealous of Amaro and Lala's new type connection being so overwhelming in the first place. How, after all, could he, the heir of Zeon Daikun, not be the very fruition of the full new type awakening? I am Psychic Space Karl Marx Jr. How is Amuro the Turbo Space Psychic Marxist? It's just not right. This inferiority has eaten him alive from within. Really, it just becomes more and more obvious as the movie goes on that this is his true motive. He will attempt to drop Axis on the Earth and become a genocidal monster if only so that he means he is granted what he truly wants. The thing which has haunted him since Sela stopped it at Ao Bao Ku in 0079. A duel to the end with Amuro Ray. The smuggling of the Psycho Frame technology to the Lunar Engineers so the new Gundam would be on equal footing with the Sazbi is what seals the deal here. In another way, though it all seems like a fatalist effort, it's a kind of extremely complex ritual suicide. It's why Shar's promise to deny is so hollow feeling why all of this manipulations of the other characters are. This is all one big, frustrated, kill-or-die climax of Shar's life. 
In this way, the thing it really reminds me of is Yukio Mishima. Mishima was a Japanese poet, playwright, and novelist who embodied outwardly an extreme Bushido masculinity, but whose plays, stories, and poems embody a deep insecurity and broiling unhappiness at this mental inferiority over just being himself. In the post-war years, he gained a following. And then, on November the 25th, 1970, he and his followers enacted a, what can only be described, as a symbolic suicide mission. They stormed a Japanese self-defense forces base and took hostages. Mishima took a balcony and spouted his ideology. Japan had grown too capitalist, too decadent, and the emperor too sidelined. The soldiers below jeered him and most of it was drowned out by the circling news helicopters. In the end, Mishima committed ritual suicide directly by seppuku. The act had accomplished little and did not motivate for any restoration of the imperial power as Mishima had spoken it would. It could be argued that Mishima, like Shar, knew the plan was absurd, that what they would do would not accomplish much of anything good, but in being so caught up in their own ideology and philosophy, they were incapable of addressing the deeper sadness which drove them. Of course, it goes one step further. Do you remember that first video where I mentioned the history of Japan and the Taisho era Zaibatsu? Well, I cut out my own work for myself. For you see, back in 1936, distraught by the hyper-capitalist rise of the Zaibatsu businesses, there was one other event worth mentioning here. The 226 incident. For this one, which Mishima's symbolic suicide would evoke in its fatal performance, a group of nationalist young officers in the army, the Imperial Japan, waged a coup. Around 1,500 army soldiers sought to seize the government, then likewise enact resounding changes to restore the emperor to power, a denouncement of the capitalist businessmen. This one as well failed, but it came the closest and left a lasting impression on the Japanese public. The symbolic emphasis was enough that it is what Mishima's strange, hypocritical, hypermasculine, insecure philosophy would choose as a suitable basis for his death effort. Now those taking note, 226 is February 26th, the February 26th incident. That is the main name of the event. Does it sound familiar? Let me just elegantly cut back to one quote which ties us all together. From the Oshian Anno interview. Going back to the phrase, heavenly punishment, I'm positive that there's people who laughed at that phrase, because we're talking about heavenly punishment in a space environment. What he's doing, Tomino, is describing the February 26th incident verbatim but the world he's created is a future battlefield in outer space. Thank you, Mr. Oshi. As you can see, Shar's personal frustration, the frustration of Mishima, the frustration of, perhaps, the young officers, ends up being enacted through these ridiculously grandiose means. The dropping of a massive asteroid, the annihilation of the Earth and the Federation, because he is the heir of Zeon. This punishing of the Earth, but really, humanity. However, underneath it all, Shar is just a person whose father died traumatically, who was made into a martyr for his philosophy, whose mother was locked away, who learned how to kill and play intrigue to grab his violent revenge. And when his father's philosophy promised a transcending, transformation into something better, he found Lala soon. Whether he truly loved Lala or just saw her as a vehicle, either way or both, Amuro Rei, a person with none of the heritage or destiny of Shar, became both romantically and in new type terms completed by Lala, only then to be tragically her killer. It is this score Shar wants to level, this frustration he is tired of. He is tired of waiting for the world and tired of not wanting to lead it astray. He will force it, but more likely die in the process, and in doing so fulfill the same dark words he shared with Amuro on the Garuda back in Zeta. If you want to change the world, you may need some human sacrifices. And, as was put there so brutally, maybe human sacrifices run in your family. Now, it would be all well and good to end this section there. After all, those are the two headliners we're here for, right? But it would be rather blind-spotted of me not to note the new young cast members. Namely, Hathaway Noah, Quest Pariah, and Yune Gus. I'm sure some people are confused. After all, Amuro and Shar are the main characters, right? Quest is fucking annoying! She's stupid! She just takes time away from them. I don't care about this cyan hair girl. Oh, how foolish these complaints are. For you see, I have another frustration with people reacting to CCA, and it relates to just this dynamic. You see, if you step back a moment from Amuro and Shar, like, really, step back, you would note that as I said earlier in the same section, 
Amuro and Char's dynamic is just a repeat of 0079 with the slight adjustments of Zeta. This leads to a very obvious fact. Char and Amuro's dynamic, and arc, is, as of CCA, pretty much complete. Despite how much they interrogate each other, how much they fight with funnels and beam sabers and de-horse riding body tackles and clumsy wrestling, nothing they say or do either stops their eventual end nor really makes that new type concept of understanding occur. But you look at the runtime and it's a full movie, so, well, it's gotta be filled with something else, right? There has to be something filling the gap of both time and emotion between Char and Amuro's fights. Tomino himself says just what that is. Interviewer. What do you think about the new characters such as Quest Pariah, who appeared in Char's counterattack? Tomino. When I decided not to include Beltorchica, I thought about what was needed to add spice to the screen, and concluded that it would be better to have a girl besides the main character, so I created Chan Agi as Amuro's partner. Since Char's counterattack is about Amuro and Char, the enemies and allies are not clearly divided, but have a very special structure in which they form a parallel relationship. For that reason, when I thought about Char and the enemy side, this time, I needed a character who would connect both. When I thought about the nature of such a character, I would only come up with a character like Quest Pariah. So I made her a major supporting character, and she connected those who were divided into enemies and allies, but not completely opposing sides. Therefore, if Beltorchica had appeared, she would have played both the role of Chan and Quest alone. A new character had to emerge from such a situation. From there, I came up with Char's counterattack. Okay, so you have that, right? Now hold on to your seat, really hold on. This next part is gonna blow you away. Okay, so we got Amuro, an unwilling but talented earnest pilot. Char, an ambition-driven but unhappy dude. And Lala Soon, a teenage girl with new type prowess who connects the two and is a romantic and spiritual connection, but also a source of conflict, right? Okay, so drumroll. You got Hathaway Noah, an unwilling but talented pilot. Gune, an ambition-driven but unhappy dude. And Quest Pariah, a teenage girl with new type prowess who pilots a giant mobile armor and who connects the two and is a romantic and spiritual connection, but also a source of conflict. Ta-da! The very same characters often maligned and complained about are literally nothing more than a full parallel for our already complete original love-slash-hate-slash-space-evolution psychic triangle. Hathaway is a guy who just ends up in mobile suits, like Amuro in 0079. He has a clear talent for piloting, but is kind of someone with more talent for machines than people, like Amuro in 0079. He also has trouble with relationships and his father, once again, like Amuro in 0079. <laughs> he also tragically ends up seeing Quest killed and ends up killing Chan, both of which the Hathaway's Flash novels continue. And look at Guni, he's an ambitious pilot with clear talents, like Char in 0079. He was artificially enhanced to compete because he was desperate to become a powerful new type, like Char in 0079. And most importantly, he is secretly harboring a plot to maybe even fucking kill Char, his boss, at the end of the day, just once again, like Char in 0079. However, he dies to Amuro because this Char's counterattack. This space town is only big enough for one space Mishima guy's navel, I tell you what. Which takes us pretty directly to quests. Oh, Argonbolt, you hate that repeated Lala thing. Oh, Argonbolt, you hated Puru. A selfish little brat of a girl. Oh, Argonbolt, you must hate quests. No. What? What the heck? Yeah, no, I actually don't mind Quest all that much. It's kind of funny. Don't get me wrong, when I saw CCA in high school, I did hate her. I had most of the same complaints everyone has. Wah, I want more Amuro. Get this girl off the screen. But about six or seven years ago, it finally kind of snapped into place in my mind. Quest is a repeat of Lala. Number seven or number 18, depending on how you count the Purus. But what sets Quest apart is also what makes me like Four and Zeta. It's how this parallel is used, not just if it is made. Four acted as a more tragic contrast compared to Lala, in her cyber enhancement subverting the new type dream. Quest then works for me for much the same reason, that I like her but hate Puru. Quest is, to be blunt, a demythologization of Lala. Lala, this figure of an absolute transcendence who died so soon, before really showing any real flaws. Lala is selfless, and her ability to haunt Char and Amuro both metaphorically and literally defines her role in Gundam. Quest then acts as the foil to this very ideal of that. Quest is an impatient, 
kinda naive. She sees Char's philosophy of new types as a cause of why her parents were fighting. She latches onto any male figure of power, while also using her new type piloting attributes ultimately to kill the very same father whose failure of parenting resulted in these flaws. In this way, Quest is an astoundingly believable teenage girl. Her name, Pariah, is so ironic to me because most if not all of her shortcomings are very obviously simply results of that. Where Puru to me felt oversaccharine a character, an anime archetype of an idealized pure little sister, Quest feels like an impertinent young lady. A believably flawed, tragic girl. And that, that, is the point. Lala, for all her new type abilities and her supernatural consciousness, was just a person. Quest is not Lala. Lala was nicer, more idealist, but what Lala and Quest were were just humans. Maybe humans with the potential for new type connection and understanding, but humans all the same. But really, to wrap up this section, there's another reason. Okay, Argonbolt, maybe Gune, Quest, and Hathaway are all this parallel setup, this duplication. But isn't that Tomino just writing what he knows? What is the ultimate point of this parallel beyond seeing the characters as humans with flaws? Well, I'm glad you asked. I also hope you are ready to feel even worse about CCA, because when you take all these elements together, the tragedy is only amplified. At the time of CCA, Amuro is in his late 20s. Char is 33. Both of them have become adults. The world they inhabit is one of adulthood. Where 0079 defines itself as a world on the cusp of many things. A neo-realist war story in a toy commercial. Futurism and space colonization versus historical parallels. And most importantly here, youth and adulthood. This is where the true tragedy of this triplicate parallel plays out, this hexagon of unfortunate events. Basically, to sum it all up, all three of the young pilots end tragically. Hathaway, a scoured boy who will relive the events of CCA for the rest of his life. Quest and Gune end up, you know, dead. The cause of their tragedy is the thing I mentioned just before now, that made up the main portion of this section. It is Char and Amaro's failure. In essence, Char and Amaro have become the cynical adults who controlled them into fighting 0079. As adults, Char's Neo Zeon and Amaro's Lando Bell have created a war which is a dark mirror of 0079's. The same political tensions boiling over. Amaro's Federation fighting to maintain an imperfect status quo in the face of Char's extremist Zeon actions. Char and Amaro have tragically ended up repeating the very same mistake that defined their youthful combat. If one of the greatest elements of what made 0079 so compelling was youth rejecting war, through the promise of the new type understanding leading to peace, then CCA is a fucking catastrophic, tragic failure. And Char and Amaro failing to understand and reach a compromise, and causing and repeating the conditions they have perpetuated the cycle of systemic violence. Char has become no better than the Zabis in his callous manipulation of the women around him like Nai and Quest, but he manipulates Gune as well. All are just tools in his schemes. And Amaro. Yes, I'm gonna criticize Amaro as well. I love him. But behind his desperation, along with Bright Noah and Lando Bell, is ultimately a continuation of the same unequal status quo. As I said in the Zeta video, the problems of the Federation are born of the Federation. There is no other ubiquitous force in the Universal Century. No other rival government with a monopoly on legitimate force, resources, taxation, and population control. The same Federation which made him who he is. In both Amuro and Char's failures, a new generation of human sacrifices has been burnt up in nuclear fusion fireballs or left mentally wounded by the sadness. This is one of the reasons I love CCA. It is such a catastrophic tragedy. The ending of Char and Amaro's stories is not a triumph for them personally. No other major franchise really has ever dared to end this way. It is ultimately a mortal mistake and falling through of the promise of new types, of youthful peace, of human beings. The frustrated souls of Shar and Amuro causing that sad conclusion. With that we come to the last section in this first Gundam series, because it is time to conclude. Can humanity change? Ultimately, that is the question of Gundam. That is the question of the Universal Century. Char's counterattack here as well is no different. In its own way, even the mobile suit is an embodiment of that. A future form of nuclear fuel, titanium flesh, and beam energy weapons, but bearing the old human shape and spirit within. The new type is only thus a further extension. 
When Shar and Amuro fought in the crumbling Albao coup, this was the question Amuro believed, and he thought it was possible. Shar was cynical. When Amuro and Shar talked on the Garuda and Zeta, their question was in just what the cost of that change would be, if it would be possible or worth it. Here in CCA, the question has not changed. Shar's personal frustration motivated his actions, his heavenly punishment, his apocalyptic axis drop, to cover the earth in radioactive ash from that impact. No matter how many times he is saying he is giving the earth a rest, the environmentalist argument of Zeon is now laughably out the window. Shar refuses to wait. If he cannot become the full new type, the supposed awakened new type, then he will punish the world. He will force it to change dramatically. If he could not have Lala guide him, then he will obliterate the world, order, and revenge. Amuro is as he has always been, optimistic, but far more patient. Change may be possible, but it will take time. Ultimately, this is the disagreement they die arguing over. This is the constant reminder presented in Mirai's scenes on Earth. Tomino, one to always think of the little people on the ground, no doubt intended this. The great sweeps of history, these systemic changes, to many little people caught in the way, it just means suffering and death. Tomino said in Mobile Suit Gundam he wanted a hope for all humans, not just some elites in space. Who will survive? This of course means exactly that. This question. This is what Amaro and Shar spend their final moments debating. I mentioned a bit over a year ago I watched through The Expanse. In many ways, The Expanse is the closest the Western work has come to something like Gundam. It has a near-future setting. It has Marco Sinaros, a terrorist belter from the subjugated poor asteroid colonies. He, like Shar, has a plan he enacts, dropping asteroids on the Earth in retaliation. At the time, I saw many comparisons to Gundam, so many people excited. But as I watched the show, I kind of lost any magic it had, season after season as it went on. No, it wasn't the realism of the spacecraft, I don't need perfect realism at all. And no, it wasn't just that it was an anime, or produced in the West. I love Western science fiction, and before I ate up Japanese science fiction, that was what I started with. No, in the end it was something much simpler. The question of change. The Expanse simply does not believe in it. No matter the proto-molecule or space extremists or asteroids, the Expanse simply does not believe humanity can change very much at all. From the company towns in space to the fact the Stargates do little to shake up the status quo, the Belters, Martians, and Earth factions are stillborn. The Expanse never believed in this, and ultimately, that was what prevented it from leaving any serious impact in my heart. Gundam instead dares to say, even if slowly, painfully, only a bit at a time, or in desperation, perhaps, yes. Where the Expanse embraces a stagnant human soul, Gundam says, perhaps that overview effect, that new type dream, can make change possible. This is a powerful question of the human heart. This is a core question of science fiction. Can people really understand? Can they learn to care more? Can we change for the better if given time? One thing I learned from studying leftism was that the scope of human history is simply too large. Too long to make an absolute judgment, let alone to dismiss the possibility outright. Just 500 years ago, the notion of widespread democratic states seemed ridiculous. Perhaps in another 500, the notion of communism or socialism will no longer seem quite so strange either. Star Trek dared to say as much, and Gundam, while taking place in a messier, uglier time less far away, also agrees. It has that spirit of hope, still alive within it, even if this time, this counterattack was doomed to fail, and even if succeeding would only harm the people of the world in its crusade against that very progress. Don't get me wrong, there are some days where I still find myself agreeing with Shar. The inability of our governments to handle the climate crisis, flailing at the whims of petrochemical companies, while forests burn and glaciers melt. While things only get worse year after year. The rampant deaths and pain inflicted by the systems we maintain. Spending our finite, one human life upholding all of this at great cost. The bloodshed and suffering I have seen us inflict on ourselves is disgusting enough that even a hundred lifetimes of retching and wailing would not do it justice. At those times I do agree with Shar. Perhaps it all deserves to be torn down to be reduced to ashes. I felt that way quite a bit when I saw Shar's counterattack ten long years ago almost now. But more often as I get older, I find myself agreeing with Amaro. These things, these changes, be it political or spiritual or philosophical, take time. The bigger the change, the longer it will need, of course. As I talk with people, I met those who found my videos. 
As I traveled, as I learned about the world, I met many people, different people, who don't seem to disagree all that much. People my great-great-grandfather didn't know existed, people my grandfather couldn't speak to, or even my father spoke as instantly and as easily as I can. The world has changed, and I refuse to give up Amaro's ideal. It is not worth mass suffering, if anything, that just holds us back. But I do believe it is possible. Gundam, but really Tomino and Shars Counterattack does as well. If you want evidence of that, look no further than how CCA ultimately ends. This massive, cynical work's conclusion. The new type Aurora which emanates from Axis as it's finally pushed back. It isn't just the magic energy of Amuro or Shar, or the magic of the Psychoframe technology. It is what the final shots show. All the other mobile suits helping, but even further. The baby being born. The old woman on her deathbed. People struggling on the highways to evacuate. The will of the Earth itself to live, to endure, and perhaps one day go further towards that better horizon. All of this life together causes the new type miracle of the Aurora, the largest proof of all that that hope, that possible change, is alive. People reacted well to that hope. They reacted strongly to Char's counterattack. They loved it. That recent NHK poll still has the new Gundam as an all-time favorite. It was a success. But its complex themes and specific politics are always there hiding in plain sight. Beneath the wonderfully realized space war was this deep tragedy, because its politics and its view was so specific. Both at the time and now, the truth is mainly lost. This was my frustration about people not getting CCA, and where it came from. My frustrations about people not seeing the political context. My frustrations about not understanding the old characters like Amuro or Shar. My frustrations about not understanding the new characters like Quest, And my frustration about the world itself. About if that change can occur. If you have watched this series, enjoyed it. If you understood it, and what I've tried to say here. And telling you the history of Japan, mecha science fiction, and mobile suit gun. That in hearing these frustrations, maybe you can now see. Maybe in some small way I achieved just a tiny part of that understanding needed. I would like to think so. Amuro and Shar's stories are now over, but I believe perhaps that change in future, that new type hope, is now maybe a little closer than before. <laughs>